Hi. In previous uh, three videos, we learned how to find uh, a maximum and minimum of a function of, with two uh, 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 of a two variables. Z equals function of x and y. Now, once we know how to do it, actually finding a maximum or a minimum of function with n variables is becoming really easy. And it, we can deduce it straightforward from what we already know. Okay, so look, let's consider a case like that. Y is a function of x1, x2, x3 until xn. So we have a finite number of independent variables or arguments uh, in this function. Now, how can we find maximum or minimum of this function? Well, look, first of all, we need to use first and second order condition. So, in case of first order condition, what did we say before? We said that we need to calculate all the partial derivatives of this function and they all need to be equal to zero. So look, the same thing needs to be done over here. All we need to do is to calculate partial derivative of y with respect to x1 and this partial derivative need to be equal to partial derivative of y with respect to x2 to the partial derivative of y with respect to x3 and all of them need to be equal to each other until derivative respect to xn and they all need to be equal to zero. Of course look, we can write this more compactly, so shorter as f1 equals to f2 equals to f3 equals to fn equals to 0. And look, this is the first order condition. As you see, the only harder task now is that we need to calculate uh, more partial derivatives. Okay, how about second order? Again, we've got a very similar story, like with the function with just two variables. We need to calculate a Hessian, so a determinant of all possible second derivatives. But, uh, in this case, as well, we need to uh, calculate all the principal minors of this Hessian. Look, of course, the number of principal minors depends on how many variables we have. Like, when we calculate it actually, in the case of uh, just one variable, our principal minor, which we didn't call it like even a Hessian, was just one derivative. Then, with two variables, we had four. And actually, we discussed this in the video about uh, uh, about partial derivatives, we generally will have uh, n to the power of 2 uh, part second partial derivatives. And then, of course, depending on how many variables we've got, we will be able to calculate more and more and more uh, first principle minus the hash. And now look, if, if we have a case that we calculated a hash and it turns out that first principal minor is negative, second principal minor is positive, which is of course uh, simply the case that we had uh, with in a function with two independent variables, and then. Okay, we now have a bigger one, so now it turns out that h3 is lower than 0, but h4 is bigger than 0, but h5 
is lower than zero, but H6 is bigger than zero until we get that negative one to the power of n times nth principal minor uh, uh, it is of course uh, it is of course lower than zero. Then, uh, oh my God, sorry, higher than zero, okay. higher, higher than zero. Then, what we are having is maximum. But look, we don't need to remember all that. But what do we get from this formula? Look, we have negative 1 up front, right? To the power of n. So, if we have negative 1 over here to the power of 1, so we have the first Hessian, we have negative 1, which needs to be negative first Hessian, which needs to be bigger than 0, which means that uh, the principal minor is lower than 0. And look, the best way to look at it is to see that it should be go like negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Of course, but this formula gives us generalization of which one should be positive and which one should be negative. But again, look, if here we have an odd number, one, three, five, seven, they're gonna be negative. But numbers two, four, so even number six, eight, need to be positive. Okay. On the other hand, if it turns out that H1 is positive and H2 is positive and H3 is positive and H4 is positive and Hn is positive, then we can be sure that this is going to be a minimum. So, now if all principal minors of the Hessian are positive, we can be 100% sure that we are dealing with a minimum. Okay, so now that we've learned how to do it, let's just do one example that should actually show us right away uh, how this application goes. Of course, we're going to do an example with three variables because, uh, well, uh, we will, even now we will have nine partial derivatives. Next time it will be 12 with four variables, so this is sufficient. Okay, so we've got z equal to 2x1 squared plus x1, x2 uh, plus 4x2 squared uh, plus x1, x3 uh, plus x3 squared plus 3. Okay. So we need to find maximum of this function. This function has three different uh, y, of course, now. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter, but let, let's use y. x1, x2, and x3. Okay, so first thing we use is first order condition, and we calculate three derivatives. First, f1, which is 4x1 plus x2 plus x3, and it needs to be equal to 0. Okay, then we calculate f2. So we differentiate this with respect to x2. We get x1 plus 8x2 equals to 0. And then we get f3 equals to uh, x1 plus 2x2. 3 equals to 0. Okay, so
So look, what we got, what we have right now, is a system of three simultaneous equations with three variables. Okay, so the best way to solve it is of course using matrix algebra. So let's put it into matrix notation. We got four, one, one. Of course, x1, x2, x3 equals to zero, zero, zero. Okay, now we've got one eight zero, and we've got one zero two. Okay, let's notice a couple of things. Look, first, this is a homogeneous system of simultaneous equations, right? We've got only zeros over here. So look, in this case, we don't need to even calculate the solutions, for example, using Cromer's rule. The solute, the only, there are only two possible cases we can have here. We can either have, uh, we can have here a, a, a case when we will have one unique trivial solution, right? So x1, x2, and x3 will be equal to uh, zero, uh, or we can have an infinite number of solutions. But uh, let's just say, uh, it, it, and look, what, what, it depends on what? It depends on the value of the determinant. If this determinant is different than zero, then we will have one unique solution, right? x1 equal to x2 equal to x3 equal to zero. But before we start calculating this determinant, let's notice some interesting things about it. Because this determinant over here, right, if I would write it for 1, 1, 1, 8, 0, 1, 0, 2, it's very, very specific, very particular, if I would say. Look, let's notice a couple of things. First, look, we have one over here, and we have one over here, right? What else? We have one over here, we have one over here. We have zero over here, we have zero over here. Huh, right? We see that there is a symmetry in this determinant, which is good because uh, probably it's going to make our life easier, and it will. But let's go further. Look, let's just say that I want to calculate now a Hessian. For this case. So look, I'm going to take, if I'm going to calculate a Hessian here, right? Remember, we're, here we have first partial derivative, second and third, and here we are differentiating with respect to x1, x2, and x3. So, let's do it. If I differentiate this with respect to x1, I'm getting 4. With respect to x2, I'm getting 1. With respect to x3, I'm getting 1. With respect, if I have 1 over here, I should have one over here, remember, Jung's theorem, Hessians are always symmetric, I should have one over here, because I have one over here. And look, if I differentiate second equation with respect to one, I get, with respect to x1, I get one, and the third one, I also get one. Now, if I differentiate this equation with respect to x2, I'm getting eight, and with respect to x3, I'm getting zero. If zero is over here, zero should be over here. And if I differentiate this with respect to x2, I'm getting zero. And finally, if I differentiate it with respect to x3, I'm getting two. And if I look at those two, it turns out that the determinant of this system is actually equal to a hash. Look, here, 
It doesn't always need to be like that. This is always going to be the case if here we are getting x1, x2 and x3 in power of 1. So if we have linear equations. So if here we would have only the power of 2, not bigger, and expressions like x1 times x2, x1 times x3, x2 times x, uh, 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 x3. Uh, but in this case we clearly see that the 2 are equal to 1. So if it turns out that we can find solutions here, we will actually uh, calculate Hessian as a byproduct. So why not do it? Okay, so in here is 64, right? 4 uh, times 2 is 8 times 8, uh, uh, 4 times uh, 8 is 32 times 2 is 64. Okay, then we've got 1 times 0 times 1, 0. 1 times 1 times 0 is 0. And then we go upstairs. 1 times 8 times 1 is negative 8. Now, then we've got 0 times 0 times 4. 2 times 1 times 1 minus 2. Look at that, this is equal to 54. So, look, at this moment, we know that this system of simultaneous equations have, have one unique trivial solution. And the solution is that x1 equals to x2 equals to x3 equals to 0. If you don't remember this or you don't believe me, think about this. If I'm going to take, use Cromer's rule, and I'm going to take this column, put it in, in, in this vector, put it inside of this column, and I'm going to perform a calculation of the determinant, I'm going to get zeros everywhere, right? Because either, even one column or row of zeros is going to always uh, result in the determinant being equal to zero. Okay, so this one we got in a bank. So we know that this is our candidate for maximum or minimum. But which one is this? Well, we can see, of course, that again, what we need to do is to calculate first principle minus. This time, there's going to be three of them. Okay, this is going to be the first one, H1. This is going to be H2. And the whole thing is going to be H3. Zero, zero, three. 
Okay, so now you know how to generalize uh, 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 generalize the notion of finding maximum of or minimum of that uh, uh, of that function of many variables. So uh, I think this is it for this video. In the next one, we're actually going to start something. Uh, we're going to try to complicate this situation a little bit. Now. We, this far, we've been assuming that we can take actually any value of x, 1, x2, x3, inside the function. But what if we cannot? What if we can choose only some? In these cases, we perform something called optimization under constraint, or we're going to use a Lagrange multiplier technique. And this is going to be the topic of our next video. Thank you for your attention and take care.